And our next speaker uh, is Father Thomas Davenport, a Dominican friar, physicist, and professor of philosophy at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome, otherwise known as the Angelicum. He is a PhD in theoretical particle physics from Stanford University and a licentiate in philosophy from the Catholic University of America, focusing on the philosophy of science and natural philosophy. He is co-author of Thomistic Evolution, a contributor to the Aquinas 101 Faith and Science series and on the executive board of SCS. His talk is entitled, This is My Body, Modern Science and the Doctrine of Transubstantiation. Welcome, Father Thomas. I really only have one slide, but we'll, we'll move on. Um, so in 2014, a group of biologists ran a PCR DNA amplification on a number of biological samples to compare the genetic, genetic material of known, uh, two known control samples. This is, from what I understand, a standard biological procedure used every day in all sorts of scientific and forensics labs. Think crime scene investigation, TV shows. This is usually what you're thinking about when you're thinking about DNA samples. Now, why would I bring up this one thing out of thousands, millions, who knows how many of these that have been done over decades? In this case, the samples were um, consecrated Eucharistic hosts that had been obtained surreptitiously stolen from a number of Catholic churches in the US and Canada. Now, I just want to say, first and foremost, that this was a horrible thing to do. Um, uh, in addition to just the fact that they're stealing things, I mean, it's horribly sacrilegious and should never have been done. Um, the scientists themselves have their own odd religious beliefs and motivations, and I'm not going to get into that. But you see, these biologists wanted to show once and for all that the Eucharist is not the body of Christ. If Catholics believe in transubstantiation, that the substance of bread becomes the substance of the body of Christ, a human body, then uh, 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 the body of Christ being a human body, then there should be some evidence of this change. And the most fundamental place that this sort of change might take place would be in something like the DNA structure of the biological material. The results of their tests uh, showed that all of the consecrated hosts had strong evidence of sections of DNA characteristic to wheat and little to no evidence of sections of DNA characteristic to human beings. So that does it. End of story, right? Transubstantiation was there, uh, true. Uh, there'd be no wheat DNA, lots of human DNA, but the results are pretty much what you would expect if you just grabbed a sample of bread from the local market. The thing is, if you asked any Catholic priest or theologian, well, hopefully most, uh, or uh, you know, a Catholic who has studied uh, the doctrine of transubstantiation, most likely they would not be at all surprised by these results. Uh, in fact, if you saw human DNA, that would be miraculous. Now, those who ran the tests and many who, you know, particularly uh, sort of atheists who commented on it, were aware of this Catholic position, but insisted that, look, any attempts to get around it, by which they're referring to 2,000 years of philosophical and theological discussion, um, are just philosophical weaseling. So this episode and much of the commentary around it show a profound confusion about the teaching of the Eucharist, uh, on the, Euchar the Catholic teaching on the Eucharist and transubstantiation. Sadly, there is even strong polling data to suggest that such confusion among Catholics themselves. And sadly, part of that confusion about the doctrine and even some embarrassment about it has been expressed by Catholic theologians in, uh, in, in previous decades and centuries. Um, and it's rooted in the kind of belief that something about modern science has made the doctrine of transubstantiation unreasonable or unpalatable or, or, or more difficult than, than it was easier back then, but we need to do something different now. We need to talk about it differently. So I would love to sit here and just start diving into the depths of the Thomistic doctrine on transubstantiation because it's fascinating and it's beautiful and I love it. But here, I actually, you know, for the sake of time and for the purpose of the talk, I want to focus on just three, in one sense, basic things, but sort of important things uh, for this topic, but more broad topics. First, I want to clarify something of the general way that human reason relates to doctrines of the faith, like transubstantiation, the doctrine of transubstantiation. It's important to see what sorts of claims and evidence we can draw on from our, from our faith when we try to understand these things, but also what sorts of evidence we can draw on in engaging with those who may not agree with us, who might disagree, who might not understand or believe in the doctrine. 
Uh, and it helps us to understand how to think about those doctrines and how to talk about them. Secondly, I want to clarify exactly what the church actually teaches about, teaches about transubstantiation. What is that doctrine? And third, to apply part one to part two. Uh, in particular, to sort of head off and avoid some of the um, ideas or, or, or worries that uh, objections that might be arise from a kind of scientific perspective or seemingly scientific perspective. So first, we need just a bit of background on faith and reason. The Catholic faith is a revealed religion, by which we mean that many of the truths of the faith are rooted in things that we believe God has revealed to us through the patriarchs and prophets, through our Lord Jesus Christ, through the authors of the scriptures, handed down through the tradition of the church and clarified in magisterial teachings. Traditionally, some things that have been revealed are knowable by, uh, by reason. For instance, the Bible says that Jerusalem is on a mountain in the Middle East. Turns out it's right. Great. <laughs> Others, perhaps less obvious, it's a, 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 a Thomistic and, and, and many aspects of Catholic theology argue that you can uh, prove by reason that God exists. Uh, it's very helpful that he showed himself and let, uh, revealed himself to us, but in theory that we should be able to prove that God exists. That said, there are many things that have been revealed that are beyond human reason, um, but they're not contradictory to reason. Human reason is a gift from God, the revealer, and used properly cannot establish anything as true that is contrary to what has been revealed. That's we saw expressed by John Henry Newman following in just a huge line of saints and, uh, uh, and theologians uh, expressing this idea and summed up so beautifully at the beginning of Fides et Ratio. Faith and reason are like two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of the truth. So we can distinguish the things that are knowable purely by human reason from those things that we re need revelation to even sort of begin thinking about. But once we have done so, we can still apply our reason to those truths that have been revealed. Beginning from what has been directly revealed by the scriptures and the tradition of the church, we can begin to think more deeply about these truths and mysteries. And this process helps us to deepen our understanding of these mysteries and explain the faith to others. Now, explaining the faith, though, comes in different forms, depending upon the audience. For Catholics who accept the truths of the faith, at least by intention, even if they haven't studied it in detail, we can describe and list the truths that have been revealed through reading scripture, uh, the, uh, the ecumenical councils, catechetical material. Further, we can apply our reason to deepen our understanding of those revealed truths. And this is the, 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 the massive work of, of the, the field of theology, to aid and support uh, the understanding of the truths of the faith with the guide, uh, you know, uh, uh, guided and by the, the work of the magisterium. Now, if we're dealing with non-Catholic Christians, we can begin from common principles of scripture to argue that particular truths of the faith really are revealed. We can share a lot here, but again, the tools are going to be more limited. We cannot presume to share. Uh, there are certain things that, as Catholics, we could take, but we could, can't presume to share. Certain aspects of the church fathers, um, certain councils, depending on who we're talking to, um, and, and many teachings of the magisterium. Even though if they don't accept those sources, we can at least argue that the sources are not contrary to the scriptures that we, that we share, that they, they resonate together with those. If we're dealing with theists who have perhaps begin from common principles about God and some notion of divinity, um, li limited to that, uh, we can argue that the Catholic teachings fit within this, under this common understanding of divinity, within the realm of what God could or perhaps would do uh, or would reveal, even if they don't ex 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 uh, accept our specific revelation. And they're not contrary to human reason and, or whatever is common in our notion of divinity. For those who do not accept the idea of God, we have to begin just simply from human reason. We cannot hope to provide a proof of the revealed truths of faith simply by human reason, and in fact, doing so would be detrimental to the faith. We need to be careful about making claims that we can prove something that is not actually accessible to human reason. As wonderful and as the, the deep mysteries of the faith are, we cannot hope to simply convince them of their truth by reason, but we can at least hope to argue that any objections they might raise to the revealed truth are not airtight objections, that the claims of the faith are at least reasonable, at least possible. This is the level at which I think this idea of interaction between the doctrine of transubstantiation and modern science lives. 
It's how do the, 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 the tools of, of, of pure human reason relate to this particular uh, doctrine. To explain what the Catholic Church actually teaches and argue in a way accessible even to those who might not believe the teachings of the faith, but at least argue that it's not irrational or impossible. So what exactly then is this teaching of the, uh, of the Catholic faith? Well, the best and most definitive place to begin when you're asking these sorts of questions is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And while the Catechism has many paragraphs discussing the details of the sacrament of the Eucharist, when it specifically defines transubstantiation, it quotes in full from the Council of Trent, session 13, uh, paragraph 4, from uh, the year 1551. Because Christ, our Redeemer, said that it was truly his body that he was offering under the species of bread, it has always been the conviction of the Church of God, and this Holy Council now declares again that by the consecration of the bread and wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ, our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change, the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly and properly called transubstantiation. So throughout the discussions of the Eucharist on the Council of Trent and in the Catechism, these words, species and substance, appear over and over in the description of the Eucharist. What begins as the substance of bread with the species of bread becomes the substance of the body of Christ with the species of bread remaining. What begins as the substance of wine with the species of wine becomes the substance of the blood of Christ with a species of wine remaining. A lot rides on these words, species and substance, which are familiar enough in a certain sense in English, but that actually is, can be somewhat problematic. We think of species, we think of the talk we had on anthropology about human species and biological species, we think of substance, we think of stuff, gunk. <laughs> These words, species and substance, were and are technical terms in the use here, uh, 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 um, here in the, the Council of Trent, and particularly flow out of uh, the philo philosophical tradition, um, or, or a particular aspect of it flows out of the philosophical tradition uh, rooted in Aristotle and common in the scholastics. But, and this is where some of the argument, oh, this is outdated philosophy, that philo it's bad philosophy now, we can't use it anymore. But these refer to very general ideas, and I want to try to clarify that briefly. So species, what, do we, what, is, what is this word species here supposed to mean? So it's taken from the Latin to see, which was a general word used, you know, well, in the original Greek and Aristotle, but then in, in scholastic conversation, for the appearance or the shape or the form of something, and it also led into conversations to distinguish certain types or classes of things from one another, which is where the contemporary biological sense of species come from. But by the time of the Middle Ages, it had taken on a very particular role in the philosoph philosophical discussions about sensation and cognition. This broadly Aristotelian framework was the, the lingua franca of the intellectual world, beginning roughly in the uh, the, 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 the 12th century and leading up to the Council of Trent and continuing on. Um, so, uh, the, uh, uh, focusing on, uh, so uh, in that context, it, um, uh, it refers, broadly speaking, to the way some physical object is made present in a cognitive faculty, first in the senses and then in the intellect. Here, we're focusing primarily on the, the sensible species, and so these were either the representation or cause or mode in which some external physical object is made present in our senses without actually being there. The way our eyes can see bread without being bread or having bread in them. Again, here I could go off on a huge tangent about the Thomistic doctrine of how this works, and it's very interesting. I think it's very compelling. I'd love to hear what the neuroscientists have to say, because I think there's some interesting resonances. But actually, the point I want to make here is that while Aquinas had his reading of it, it was immediately debated by lots of other scholastics as well. That you have the, the Thomistic way of talking about species, but you also have the Gilbert of Rome, you have, you have Scotus, you have Occam, you have lots of different ways of using this language to refer to this general pattern by which physical things come to exist in our sensible experience, and yet they end up saying very, very different things. 
For some, they were some sort of material thing that somehow moved between the exterior object and the observer. For others, it was some sort of immaterial transmission uh, or something in between. For some, like Occam, there wasn't anything in between. It was some kind of odd direct action at a distance with the physical object. The point being that there was lots and lots of ways that this was cached out in detail. Um, and the, the, the fathers of the Council of Trent understood this. Again, while I find the Thomistic account very compelling, and I think it might, I would argue, surprise, surprise, uh, Dominican here, uh, it's, it's the best account of how to deal with this. The Council of Trent, and you can see this in their conversations, were intentionally using the word species to avoid getting into the philosophical details. They didn't want to commit to some particular interpretation of how that worked. The species of bread simply referred to the sum total of the way that we sense bread, however that worked in practice. The sum total of the way that bread leaves some sort of impression upon us. The second word, substance, has a similar deep philosophical history. In Latin, it literally translates as to stand under, and it came to refer to the things that undergird objects in the physical world. Again, Aristotle introduces this idea in contrast to accidents, which are, roughly speaking, the properties of things. Um, so imagine a squirrel, right? So imagine in your mind. Um, what you're imagining should, hopefully, be a small, bushy-tailed animal that is brown or black or gray, depending where you live, eating nuts and hibernating. Roughly speaking, Every description we might make about the squirrel, its size, its shape, its color, its temperature, the arrangements of its organs, the things it does, these are all accidents, properties of the squirrel. Um, what unites them all together is that they all are properties of the same substance, this squirrel. As above, Aquinas has his particular reading on this that is very close to Aristotle and I find very compelling and I think actually helps make sense of a lot of issues in contemporary science, but that's a whole other talk. But again, for the authors of the Council of Trent, they are aware that as, while there's a Thomistic way of reading this, there's, again, the Gilbert of Rome, you've got, you've got uh, Scotus, Occam, Albert's different than Aquinas. I mean, almost every theologian has a little, or every scholastic has a little bit of a, 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 a tweak on some of these things. For the, for the authors of the Council of Trent, the using the word substance did not imply any particular understanding of the world. It just meant whatever it is that makes that thing be that thing. Importantly, the church didn't just stumble across this word substance in the context of talking about the Eucharist. This is also hugely important well before any, uh, uh, any the, the, the reception and use of any Aristotelian philosophy in detail in the early councils of the church, talking about Christology as well. So all those who use these technical terms of species and substance a, whatever, as much as they disagreed with one another, they all generally agreed that in nature, these two ideas are extremely closely connected. Through the sensible species in some way, and here I'm importing a little bit of some more specifically Thomistic ways of talking about it perhaps, but the way something appears to my senses, I begin to understand what it actually is. I gain access to the reality, the substance, in some way through the species. A certain collection of sensible species strongly suggest a particular substance. Small, gray, furry, bushy tails. Oh, that's a squirrel. Great. Some of the species can change while the substance stays the same. I haven't always been six foot three, but I have always been the same human person, the same substance. But if enough species change, if enough of the way something appears change, it's a pretty good sign that the substance has changed. If that gray, bushy-tailed object has an interesting encounter with a car and suddenly is very, very flat and isn't moving, it's a very good sign that it's not actually a squirrel anymore, that something else is there. In nature, changes in substance are always very, very closely connected to changes in species, the appearance of things, because no two substances affect our, our sense in exactly the same way, no two types of substances. Now, it can be hard to distinguish exactly when one substance becomes another, but the way we try to figure that out is by careful attention to the sensible species, how it appears to us. The relation between how a thing acts when we observe it and what the thing is, is the foundation of all of our knowledge about the natural world. And importantly, this is the foundation of all of our observation and experimentation in modern science as well. Close attention to the observable properties of physical things give us insight into what they are, how they relate to one another. So, in transubstantiation, the Catholic Church claims something very, very strange. 
the whole substance changes while the species remain exactly the same. Although the host looks and tastes the same before and after the priest consecrates it, the real change of substance has occurred. The substance that is there, what is really there, is no longer the bread, but the body of Christ. Similarly, what looks and tastes like wine is really the blood of Christ. This is weird. This is counterintuitive, literally, like by definition. Our intuition follows our senses, what are screaming at us. No, look, that's bread. Like it looks like bread, it tastes like bread. No, that's, that looks like wine, it tastes like wine. Uh, it, it takes an act of faith of a source of truth not simply derived from human reason about the natural world, not simply to accept it, but even consider the possibility that something of the substance of the Eucharist has changed. Now, again, this reality underlying the Eucharist doesn't agree with what our senses are telling us, and that is strange. And it's not natural. This is contrary to the normal workings of nature. But God, who creates and sustains every substance and being, and undergirds by his power the action of every species and our senses and our intellect, allows, apparently just in this one case, this unnatural arrangement. Here the species presented to our senses, or to our scientific tests or instruments, please don't, does not correspond to the substance that really undergirds it. This is unscientific. All of our scientific measurements deal directly, primarily, with species. How is it that one substance affects another and eventually, through instrumentation, our species, or our, our, our senses? That impact real things, um, we don't have direct access to the substance except through the species. Now, again, here some of the scholastics might debate with me a little bit, but uh, there are certain scholastic theories that would be a little bit different there. Again, sidebar. Broadly speaking, we just don't measure substance. We measure, we measure the, the, the species and reason to the substances that are there. This is hard to believe. Christ himself admitted as much in the Gospel of John. So why do we as Catholics believe this? Well, we just take seriously the words that Jesus Christ at, uh, said at the Last Supper as witnessed to in the Gospels and in Paul's letters. This is my body. This thing I'm holding that looks like a piece of bread and will taste like a piece of bread the moment you put it in your mouth, and if you do something stupid with it, whatever you try to observe it will act like bread. This is my body. This is my blood. The witness of the early church fathers, beginning with the Didache and leading through um, uh, I'm sorry, with the early church, beginning with the Didache and leading through the church fathers, and the consistent teaching developed over centuries has clarified this. The, the word transubstantiation itself was introduced specifically to clarify confusion over the, the doctrine of the Eucharist, but with the intention of, of clarifying the ancient, the, the, the ancient understanding passed down by the fathers. And interestingly, this happened in the 11th century, two centuries before Aquinas' birth, a century before anybody had found a Latin copy or had made a Latin copy of Aristotle's physics. Uh, this is not a primarily Aristotelian idea that they're using. This is just the language they have to talk. So transubstantiation and these ideas of species and sub, uh, transubstantiation is not a Thomistic or a scholastic notion, but a Catholic notion, a technical word used in an attempt to clarify and defend an ancient teaching. So in this last portion, there are lots and lots of objections that can be raised here, depending on who you're talking to, right? Um, Jesus didn't mean that. That's not what he meant. If you're talking with certain Protestants, they might argue in that direction. And here we would get into arguments about uh, the meaning of Scripture and the interpretation of Scripture and the teachings of the, of the church fathers. Some people say, like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would God allow that? Why would God do that? Perhaps you have a, 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 a Muslim or someone who doesn't uh, accept our Scriptures but understands something of the idea of God. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. Well, here you can make arguments about Revelation and the whole, uh, Revelation as a whole and the coherence of Catholic Revelation about the love of God and what that has in connection with the Eucharist. You could argue, you could have someone argue, oh, that's, in, that's impossible because God doesn't exist. There's no being out there that can do this kind of thing. And that's just a whole other argument. Okay, let's talk about why God might exist. But you could have an argument that that's not possible because even if God did exist, he couldn't do this. The very concept is somehow irrational and impossible. And this is the, the place that I want to focus. 
One form of this kind of argument is, okay, yes, the, the very language of the church is based on an outdated view of the world, and in a modern scientific context, it's incoherent or nonsense. Now, it's true, yes, species and substance are unfamiliar uh, in this context to, to modern ears. The concepts, though, are not. They are, in fact, recognized at the most fundamental levels of science, and if you go into philosophy of science, it's all over the place. Not in the language, but the ideas. We recognize that to understand some physical object, we have to observe it as carefully as we can under a variety of controlled circumstances, which give us a whole host of ways to, the object impacts our tools and instruments and eventually our senses. From this, we think deeply about what the thing we are observing is. I would argue that in many ways, it's actually clearer in contemporary, uh, uh, contemporary science than it might have been a few centuries ago. And if you look at quantum mechanics, there seems to be some hard distinctions and some arguments between what we measure and the mathematical picture of what underlies that. Debate over the nature of the wave function as compared to various measurements. About what's really there versus what we're observing in our experiments. Again, uh, in fact, you know, quantum mechanics has its own kind of scientific and very, very counterintuitive claims about species and how they act, how things interact with our instruments in our, in our, in our, our, our uh, eventually our, our, our senses. Um, in the way in which, you know, um, what, like, in, in debates about what underlies all of that. Now, again, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics is not exactly line up with the concept of substance and species here. Um, you can still quantify the, the, um, the, the wave function and so, you know, that's, but that's a, a, a Thomistic argument for later. But I just want to say that the, the limits that quantum mechanics places on what is directly, direct observation can tell us reminds us of a fact that we're working through observation to get to reality. That at least in principle we can separate those two ideas of the way something is observable and the way something actually is. And that it reminds us of something that's been there all along, even if we haven't always noticed it. Science at its best is built on our ability to observe and experiment on this physical world. Uh, we begin with those sensible species. We use those to build up these detailed patterns and pictures. Again, for most scientists, this gives us confidence, and I think rightly, that we have achieved real knowledge. Oh, sorry. My, uh, oh, come on. Oh, no. Uh oh. This is embarrassing. All right. Uh, what's going on here? It was charged. All right. Oh, there you go. All right. So, um, so it gives us real confidence that the, the world, uh, th that our observations tell us something about the real world, that we have some sort of uh, direct access to that. Um, and that there's a way in which we're working through what is sensible and what, it, what impacts the, 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 um, uh, the, our instruments and eventually our senses to say something about the reality. And that we, while these things, again, are closely connected, we can distinguish those. Um, now, you can say that there are, so, so the idea that science as such has somehow disproved this distinction between species and substance, I think is just, is just false. It's all over the place and definitely in the philosophy of science um, and arguably in science itself. Now, you can make a claim further on that there are philosophical interpretations of science uh, that would be, that would make the notion of transubstantiation impossible. Yes, absolutely. Uh, to take a somewhat absurd example, right, if you believe science so much that you believe that we're living in a simulation and that all sense data is just some sort of like per working out of computer code in some supercomputer, um, yeah, so then transubstantiation is false, great. Um, but a lot of other things are false too. Um, uh, it's not just transubstantiation that's the problem there. If you take a more reductionistic, materialistic picture of things where the only thing that exists are whatever the smallest fundamental thing is, you know, whatever the particles or fields or strings you get, and that's all there is, and the thing here giving this talk and frustratingly annoyed at his, his laptop right now is just a weird cloud of particles and fields, then yeah, then there is no, there is no substance of the body of Christ to even talk about, let alone the substance of bread. So there are philosophical interpretations that you can make based off of contemporary science that would, yes, be very problematic for the doctrine of transubstantiation. But I would argue that any philosophical, uh, 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 philosophical um, reading or philosophical interpretation of science or philosophy built on science that is going to be problematic for transubstantiation is going to be problematic for pretty much any other serious Catholic doctrine as well. 
Um, there's something odd about transubstantiation in this disconnect between species and substance, but usually the, the, the place people focus on is, oh, well, we don't believe in substances anymore. And if we go down that road, then all sorts of things about the nature of Christ, all sorts of things about uh, the, the Trinity, all sorts of things about grace and salvation become very problematic as well. Uh, so the, the, I, the argument I want to make here is that transubstantiation is very strange. But it's always been very strange. There's not something different about contemporary science that makes transubstantiation harder. The only thing that, that is different now than when the Council of Trent declared it is that the language has changed. The terminology is different. But if we're afraid to talk about transubstantiation because we're afraid to talk to scientists about transubstantiation because we're afraid of technical terminology, we don't understand scientists very well because there's all sorts of technical jargon that we throw around. And the idea that we need to be careful in our definitions and clarify those things, I think that's something that scientists and philosophers should be able to handle. That there is uh, a beauty to the picture of, the, uh, 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 there's a, a usefulness to uh, um, using that language. Perhaps in certain conversations you might translate them into slightly different terminology, but the ideas undergirding them I think are continuous and useful even today. Um, just as a, a last thought, then, so how might you actually talk to uh, your, you know, if, if you want to go beyond simply convincing your atheist friend uh, that, that transubstantiation isn't utterly insane, um, that at least the definitions aren't illogical, and say, well, why would this, why would you want this to happen? I think then we get into much more deeper questions about asking them to imagine, just for a moment, if this were true. Asking, for, uh, asking them to imagine for a moment that there was a God who loved them, who sent his son into the world to save them, and who allowed this utterly strange and utterly weird way of being present in the world that makes him accessible to us in a way that is even hard, if we admit it, for us Catholics to understand. And yet, by experience and by faith, trusting, as Aquinas says, not so much in our senses, but primarily in the hearing, in the hearing of the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is my body. Thank you. Oh, so thank you, Thomas. Um, I enjoyed it a lot. I agree with you that we have a problem with the species and substance, mm -hmm. but so if you keep the disconnection mm -hmm. too much, I think, um, yeah, th that's a problem for, for many people. Mm -hmm. And I think that we still could speak about some reasons of, com of convenience. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, are you familiar with that term? Because yeah. it explains why our Lord can be present in bread and wine, under the speech of mm -hmm. bread and wine, and not, I don't know, in a thermostat. Yeah. Because bread and wine have also some meaning oh, yes. in a Mediterranean culture mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. food, so God yes. uh, gives us as, as, as food. So what I mean is that uh, perhaps we also can cover a little bit of that distance mm -hmm. between speech and, and substance recurring to all that cultural atmosphere in which this, this happens. No, absolutely, yes. I mean, if you actually wanted to, you know, I mean, I don't know what, I don't know what question two from the atheist would be after you sort of try to at least bear it down, but like one of them is like, okay, so why bread, why wine? And that is, I mean, absolutely an, an important and very interesting theological question. And I think um, that, that deepens and clarifies why, like, the uniqueness of what we're talking about in the Eucharist and is eventually hugely important in this. But I don't think the objection raised by most, like, by, by, by atheists who actually try to talk about this or even the, the kind of concern that you sometimes hear from some Catholic theologians about the terminology of transubstantiation is actually related to those cultural. That's a, that's a different concern about why is it that we can't consecrate, say, wafers made completely from rice, or why is it that we can't consecrate something besides wine? Um, and that's a different theological question. Um, and the language of substance and species would be important in that, and um, uh, in, in, in certain modes. But I feel like that's a, a 
it's a, it's a, a different objection that people have or concern that people have. But it, here I was trying to focus specifically on that the very idea of transubstantiation is incoherent or, or problematic in a contemporary idea. There are other reasons people think that the doctrine of the Eucharist more broadly is problematic um, or, or needs to be expanded or varied. I think there are other ways to defend that. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Okay, Th yeah. thank you for your uh, talk. Um, in many ways, um, as you were presenting that the fact that there's no opposition between modern science and the doctrine of transubstantiation. I would say that we're living in a time where modern science now even come to the rescue of mm -hmm. transubstantiation. Oh, um, in fact, um, there's um, acknowledged Eucharistic miracles that have been happening all over the world that uh, in many ways take advantage of science for identifying truly what's happening at the level of this Eucharistic miracle. Mm -hmm. And uh, in many ways also, um, as science uh, focus on reproducibility, mm -hmm. uh, in this case, yes, uh, we're not the as human beings, we're not those who are deciding when the miracle happened. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, uh, here we have a multiple miracles that mm -hmm. happen at different times. And that in fact, backed up by modern science, highlight that there's something unique happening at the level of uh, the, these bread that transform into uh, uh, a piece of the heart mm -hmm. that is, yeah. in fact, uh, as sought to be the one of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So uh, really, I, I think, um, what do you think about this? Yeah, so, um, so you, you uh, so there are, you know, Ancient, you know, ancient and medieval and contemporary Eucharistic miracles, and again, you hear actually, you know, there's some recent stories about some of them going on, and they're very beautiful, but we need to be careful here, um, just in the sense that they are miraculous, and miracles are, broadly speaking, generally sort of one-off events that occur for some particular reason, usually for the the, the revelation of some act of God's um, love for someone in particular, so Maybe, and, and you know, we talk about scriptural miracles, contemporary miracles, various healings that happen. Um, but the Eucharist, you know, in, as a sacrament, happens regularly, but in a way that is not in any way observable. So while Eucharistic miracles aid in Catholics believing the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's not as if when a miracle doesn't happen, nothing happened. Right, so that we, we need to be a little bit careful there. So I think it can be a tool in the conversation, but I think we have to be careful about uh, that, that, that in, in distinguishing that from a broader defense of the, the doctrine as direct, uh, the, uh, the doctrine directly. Yeah. No, I, 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 no, I, no I, I, I do think it is. It is it's an aid to the faith, um, an aid to individual people's faith, and I think that's great. But I, I, wanna, I just want to I, I separate that conversation from the specific question of does science somehow contradict the very claim the church is making? Because the whole question of what's going on miraculously, there you can actually measure and test things because something of the accidents has changed or that the species has changed. It's not actually bred anymore in any way whatsoever, not even in terms of the way it appears. There's a whole other theology of exactly in what way is Christ present and how is, how is the real presence continues in Christian miracles or not, and there's medieval debates about this. So I just want to say, like, the miracles are unique and special, and whereas transubstantiation happens every single day in churches all over the world and in a way that's not... So it's an aid, but it's a different question, I think, or a, different, a slightly different conversation, a parallel conversation. Yeah. Okay, and this is going to be our last question. A lot of pressure on me. Um, I was thinking of the experiment, and the the mm -hmm. atheist scientist yeah. essentially is setting up a straw man. Yeah. God is this. Yeah. Therefore, I test the mm -hmm. consecrated wafer. I don't see what yep. I said. Therefore, yeah. it's not concentrated, or therefore, God mm -hmm. does not exist. Mm -hmm. It's just. Uh, would you comment on that? The nature of the experiment. Just because, you know, you set up a straw man and knock it down doesn't mean you prove. Oh, absolutely. Anything. No, and, and I, what, I guess the, the reason I bring that up is because that's the kind of thing people, you know, when you put up a title like the Eucharist in Modern Science, 
that's the sort of image I think people kind of get in their mind. Well, like, what's what's going like? You know, there's a particle physicist talking about 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 you know the Eucharist of modern science. So like, what fundamental forces are being tweaked in transubstantiation to change this bread into the body of Christ? And I think at some level that's the way that I think a lot of if atheists would think about it, that's the level that they would try to think about it, uh, or, or I mean, at least some subset have, and even I think some Catholics can fall into that in a little bit. A little bit. And so I wanna, what I um, want to clarify is, yes, it absolutely is a straw man. I mean, if you actually, I mean, if you look at how PCR works, like by the time they're doing anything close to an actual like, like it's it's not it's it's no longer a consecrated host by the time that you know you've dissolved it into other things. Like it's it's still sacrilegious and bad. But anyways, whole other side side, side thing. But just to say that, yeah, like, it, but what I want to point out is that that's a, it's a lack of understanding of the terminology and also a kind of, uh, uh, you know, it, it, and that's in part not their fault, but also uh, uh, um, in, in part a, a presumption of like, a, a presumption of sort of simplicity in the way that the Catholics think about what's going on there. Um, and, and not actually engaging with a very difficult and yet very sort of subtle teaching of the church that is has been fleshed out in various ways um, in different, you know, Catholic theological traditions, but is rooted in something that is relatively simple, that is very strange and hard, um, but is not actually that, it, it's not, it's relatively simple to express. Um, and so that's kind of what I wanted to sort of, why I use that as, a, as an opening image. So, thank you. <laughs>